welcome everyone to the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. Um, I'm Grace Rooney, and I'm an intern in the Marketing and Public Programs Department at the museum, and I'm pleased to welcome you today to our inaugural New York Jewish Book Festival. This event is on Jewish children's literature, The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, with Marjorie Ingle, Lizzie Skernick, and Sophie Brookover. We hope you'll explore our 32 events happening throughout the museum today, meet some of our 85 speakers, and get books signed at our s one of our 72 author signings in our main lobby and in our events hall on the second floor. And while you're here, we also encourage you to take time to visit our exhibition, The Holocaust, What Hate Can Do on the Main Level, and Survivors, Faces of Life After the Holocaust, photographs by Martin Scholl on the third floor. Our Garden of Stones is also worth a visit by Andy Goldsworthy, and that is outside of our Cafe Locks. Um, and then you can also pick up holiday gifts and books at the Picking Museum Shop and Visitor Services Center on our main level. And we are encouraging people to wear masks in the museum, and we hope you'll share your feedback on us with our post-festival survey, which we will email to you tomorrow. And this program is made possible in part by support from the Battery Park City Authority and from your donations, so thank you. And now I'm glad to introduce you to our speakers. Um, Marjorie Ingle is the author with Susan McCarthy of Sorry, 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 The Case for Good Apologies, forthcoming in January. She's also the author of Mamala Knows Best, What Jewish Mothers Do to Raise Creative, Empathetic, Independent Children, and The Field Guide to North American Males. A former columnist for both Tablet Magazine and Forward, she is the co-creator of the apology watchdog site, sorrywatch.com, and a frequent contributor to the New York Times Book Review. She's also written for New York Magazine, Town & Country, Ms., Glamour, Self, Elle, and Sassy. Uh, Lizzie Skernick's most recent work is Pretty Bitches on being called angry, bossy, frumpy, feisty, and all the other words that are used to undermine women. She is the author of That Should Be a Word, a much-needed lexicon for the modern era of shelf discovery. Teen classics will never stop reading. As the founding editor of Lizzie Skernick Books, she has reissued dozens of young adult classics, and Skernick is a frequent con contributor to the New York Times, NPR, PBS, L, Jezebel, and many other publications. She also teaches at NYU. And Sophie Brookover has been a culture writer since she could hold a pencil, although she didn't know that in kindergarten. She was just really jazzed about her Muppets LP she'd received for Hanukkah. During her, <laughs> during her career as a librarian, she reviewed children's and YA literature for School Library Journal and Kirkus Reviews and served as the Michael L. Prince and Margaret A. Edwards Award Committees. She now writes criticism and explainers for cultural outlets, including Vulture, Town and Country, Avidly Alma, and her weekly cultural recommendations and criticism newsletter, Two Bossy Dames. Mamala Knows Best and Pretty Bitches will be available in our Pikmin Museum shop in the lobby following the talk, and Marjorie and Lizzie will sign copies for a half an hour in the resource area on the events hall on the second floor. So without further ado, please welcome our speakers. We applaud Grace's, um, like, your lung power. That is very, very impressive. That's very impressive. All right. So... The three of us, I have, we have met before, yes. and the two of you had met before. Whoa. No, yeah. oh my goodness, all right, this is very exciting yeah, for us fanfic. to meet really you. <laughs> and rightly so. <laughs> all right, so um, I prepared some questions in advance, and if my face ID will cooperate. <laughs> yeah. Oh, this is gonna be a pretty wide-ranging conversation, so um, strap in. We hope that you yeah, will enjoy it. Oh, yes, for sure, for sure. Okay, so I want to begin uh, at the beginning, which I, I hear pretty reliably from Rodgers and Hammerstein, <laughs> is a very good place to start. Um, so I would like to ask our wonderful panelists, what is your definition of Jewish children's literature, uh, both in terms of what it covers, what it covers, who it's for, and who writes it? No, but it's your panel. But it's your panel. <laughs> No, so um, I, so my definition of uh, Jewish children's literature. So I grew up with a black mother who was an English professor and a Jewish father who was an engineer, and my mother was always trying to get my father to read. So we we had lots of books about black history and Jewish history. We also had the Black Jews of Harlem. You know, we had a big, big, widespread. So my childhood reading about the Holocaust was like night. And I think I read Our Crowd. Uh, this is, a, you know, I read like Nicholas and Alexander. It was whatever was on my mother's shelves that she was trying to get my <laughs> father to read. And then when I was older, you know, probably when I was like 10, then I started reading The All of a Kind Family. And, but now that we're talking, I'm trying to think of what the first book I would have read as a child that was like a Jewish book. And I'm really thinking 
It Was Night, which is not a children's book. So, <laughs> but yeah, but then later it got more fun. Yeah. Um, I think the broader we define Jewish children's literature, the better we are. Um, I don't think you have to be Jewish to write Jewish children's literature or read Jewish children's literature. Um, I think that, um, you know, the assumption that Jewish children's literature is going to depict Ashkenazi life, um, we shouldn't have that assumption. Um, and we should, I think, you know, one reason why we didn't have that much was because there wasn't that much. Right. And I think just Sally J, just Sally J, who we love to yeah. pieces. Um, I recently reread a couple of Judy Blooms, and they absolutely hold up. And she's actually the uh, the source of the best how to get your children to read or grandchildren to read advice um, I've ever heard. Which is if you want your kids to re or grandkids to read something, leave it out, and say if if you see them looking at it, you say, "Oh, I don't think that you're ready for that yet." <laughs> <laughs> Um, but that's how I got to read Wifey, and I really shouldn't have read Wifey. Yeah. Probably. You know what? <laughs> so my, my mom is here, and I read at the Putnoy's house party. I found a copy of Forever when I was nine, and I was reading it in a corner, and a couple of people came up to my mom and was like, do you see what she's reading? <laughs> and my mom was like, if she has questions, she'll ask me. Aww. And that's good parenting. <laughs> so um, I think that part of... You know, right now we are in a movement of we need diverse books, and we have been fortunate that I think it took a little while, but Jews have been included in this movement, and people are looking for more Jewish stories and not just for Jewish audiences, and are coming to Jewishness and the notion of Jewish books with, um, you know, some of us have been pleading for this for 15 years, is give us more kinds of stories. And so um, I was on the Sydney Taylor Committee, which chooses the best uh, children's books of the year, and I've been on the New York Times Best Illustrated Books Committee. And this is a list from, if you, if you want to know what's happening in the world of Jewish children's and YA literature, you have to read the Sydney Taylor Schmooze, which is a blog by three former, uh, three former, pa past three former chairs of the Sydney Taylor Committee who are all super smart. Um, Susan Cassell, Heidi Rabinowitz, and Chava Pinchuk. And this is what they said. We want more Jewish books for youth in the following categories. Diversity and intersectionality in everything. LGBTQ plus themes, especially below YA level. Neurodiversity of all types. Graphic novels, we cannot emphasize this enough. This is the number one request from our library patrons. Uh, fantasy, which I would argue has had a humongous renaissance, and or not renaissance because it didn't exist before. There's been a, a real blossoming of Jewish fantasy in, I would say, the last five years. Um, but they say, please branch out from Dybbuk's and Golems. <laughs> <laughs> uh, comedy, please, lots more comedy. Uh, what else do they have? Books on Jewish holidays other than Hanukkah. Um, books set in a wider variety of locations in North America and in the rest of the world. Books about Sephardic Jews and Mizrahi Jews and their traditions. Uh, representation from all streams of Judaism. And I think that we are seeing a, a more representation of completely unaffiliated Jewish kids in Kidlit and Orthodox kids in Kidlit. And there's a middle ground in there that it would be fun to see more of. Interfaith representation, given how many interfaith families there are. Um, books about Jewish music, theater, and art, immigration stories not centered around Ellis Island or the Holocaust, nonfiction about Israel, uh, contemporary settings, um, and I like the last thing, biographies of Jewish people, especially women we haven't heard about before. Enough already with the biographies on Anne Frank, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Albert Einstein, Hank Greenberg, and Harry Houdini, and then somebody added, and Mark Chagall. <laughs> So, lots more there. That is a significant wish list. Uh, did you have something to add to this point? I think you do. <laughs> no, I don't. It was just that I remember the other book I read as a child was were just the tales of Chelm with my mother and Isaac oh, yeah. Bashevitz Singer. <laughs> she was she was a real classicist as as. <laughs> That's a, a tremendous wellspring of humor. Like if people, you know, we get, 
one of the areas that you know we dominate is is humor. And uh, I, as I was thinking about like what is my, where did I start with Jewish literature? Like my mom read me all the Hatanton stories, potato pancakes all around, all the kind family. Um, and at a certain point, I was able to read for myself. And so uh, she was like, I think you're going to like this. These are stories about people who are very foolish. <laughs> and they're really funny. And I think that that was not only the first work of Jewish literature that I read to myself, but also the first, my first individual experience with comedy. Like not uh, going beyond my beloved Muppet show, which was mentioned previously, um, like just real. <laughs> You know, oh, people can write things uh, that they're funny on purpose. Yeah. Like, th yeah. and it's not just jokes. You know, there's there's a whole world that's happening there. It's very textured, and a lot of comedy comes from people being in knowing each other and knowing each other's foibles. I also think a nice thing about the Chelm stories is that the adults are morons, and kids really like reading about oh. stupid adults. Yeah. It is it is a breath of fresh air and a balm. <laughs> so we talked. You guys talked a little bit about this, but I want to dig into it just a bit more. How would you describe your relationship with Jewish children's literature over the years? Like you, we've talked about how we've all been readers ourselves. Did that shift when you became parents? Um, you know, you're both critics. How has that? How have those different phases of your life affected your relationship to Jewish literature? Uh, I'm starting. <laughs> I would say. Let's see. So I grew up, I don't know how many people read a lot of Norma Klein. <laughs> so they don't read her anymore. And so I feel like when I was, so Norma Klein is allegedly children's literature. She was sold as YA, but she's really not YA. It's just lots of girls on the Upper West Side having affairs with their professors <laughs> who work at Columbia. That's uh, So I just had a very strange view of, what children's <laughs> literature was, you know, and <laughs> and no one, you know, it was more really uh, about the Jewish experience, not only in New York, but just specifically on the Upper West Side in 1978. Um, and then uh, I, I think my experience was, you know, as an editor, I was lucky enough to have another uh, historian tell me when the All of a Kind family books were going out of print. Um, and I think think it was then when I wanted to rescue them and put them back in print, which, and, and then I think they sadly went out of print again, but I would blame the publisher for that. Um, they weren't Jews. And, but, you know, and so I think my experience there was with such a tactile sense of Jewishness because, you know, my grandmother was from Ukraine. She, you know, bought rye bread. She lived in the Bronx. You know, that's where my father had grown up. And so... Then it was really historical. It was getting to see where this side of my family had grown up. So it was sort of bi-generational. You know, it was the teenage life I was supposed to be living, which I was not living. And, and then, but the life my grandmother had lived, which was really great to see. Um, I, too, grew up with Katantan. Um, but I feel like when we were growing up, there wasn't that much good stuff. And so, yes, for me, becoming a parent... Well, uh, when I was at Sassy, I edited the books column there, so I was really interested in, I've always been interested in children's literature, and I feel like, uh, you know, when, when they say about voting, as California goes, so goes the nation, I feel like as kid lit goes, so goes literature, um, that it's often, you know, discussions about representation and discussions about intersectionality that feel, and who gets the right, to, who has the right to tell stories, I feel like those are sort of, uh, thriving in the adult sphere now, but people were talking about that in KidLit years ago. Um, and, um, you know, just to go back to what Lizzie said about All the Kind Family, and, and Sophie too, is there's a reason why that is like the or text for anybody who loves Jewish, that's like middle grade. But this, the joy that suffuses those books the love of food rivaled only by Lizzie is the master of writing about food in um, Little in uh, Little House on little the Prairie, on the which prairie. is the other, you know, that's the racist version. Um, but <laughs> like, no, it's it's and if they you were starving in real life. And they were starving, and you know, no, 
you know, uh, they did sort of manage to make, a, you know, sucking on a pig's tail sound appealing in the Little House books, but the descriptions in All of a Kind Family of chickpeas in a rolled paper cone and, and salt on the corned beef. Salt on corned beef and yeah. broken crackers. And can you really, can we spend a quarter of a penny on candy? No, you can only spend half a penny and choosing the candy. Um, they are so... Uh, visceral and um, and and the love and conflict of families is in there, and I think that you know there were and and, and don't forget the uh, is it Henny who who Hen won't eat it's Sarah it's Sarah Sarah, Sarah you know there's there's really a whole chapter about a girl who won't finish her dinner yeah you and know and because the family is very poor the father insists that she finish it right and she can't sits there for. Two days, not getting fed anything else. Yes, and then takes a bite and chokes and cries. And, every and, yeah. and everybody, <laughs> you know. But but so there was even really, you know, there was happy food, but there was also sort of the way food functions in families. Yes. The deep experience, <laughs> emotional experience of food. Yeah. And, you know, and I think that was important, And that's too. one of the few things you have control of as a child, so I think it's particularly fun to read about food. Oh, sorry. Um, we're going to talk about, you know, the, the title of the session is The Good, the Bad, the Ugly. Um, we have some very strongly held opinions about, imagine that, imagine, <laughs> three Jewish women with strong opinions about things. <laughs> Who could have guessed? Um, we have some really strong opinions about some trends, just like lo decades long trends in Jewish children's literature that we are sick to death of. Let's 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 talk about the Holocaust, guys. <laughs> no, well, you know, a, a trend I was tired of, even even when I was an adolescent, is became really fashionable to have a child befriend a former Nazi <laughs> that they didn't know was a Nazi, yeah. and then you know think deeply about why it was complicated, you know, and the Nazi would always, like half the time the Nazi would live in like a beach, you know, cabin somewhere, and you'd be like, how is this Nazi, you know? <laughs> and so, it, we, you know, and I found that really, I mean, it was, and also, you know, they were often written by writers who were not Jewish. And I think almost only written by writers who are not Jewish, except in the case of Summer of My, Summer of My German Soldier, which is a true story. Uh, which is about a Jewish girl who befriends a prisoner of war, you know, who then helps her with her abusive father. But that was a true story, so it was different. And I think I really disliked those because it seemed like these non-Jewish authors were really mostly interested in sort of mediating the experience of why someone might be a Nazi. Which is terrible. Like, let's talk about the complicated things that made this person a Nazi, <laughs> which is not really the only way you can learn about the Holocaust. And the Holocaust is not the only part of being a Jew, you know. And so Emmy Kerr, who is one of my, I love her, but when she wrote Gentle Hands, you know, I it's, love it, well, it's about somebody who befriends somebody who may or may not be a Nazi. <laughs> <laughs> and so I would say that was my, and I, and I think Lois Lowry wrote one too. Am I crazy? No, maybe not. Oh, 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 no, not Number the Stars. No, not Number the Stars. I, I, who the, I, I'm sorry, Lois. But so, yeah, I don't remember who the other person was. But, um, but yeah, that was my least. What, who was it? Yes. Oh, yeah, maybe oh, that's the worst. What it is. The worst. Yes. Um, yes. Um, so. The Boy in the Striped Pajamas, which yeah. I keep meaning to tweet at the Jewish Museum, which has it in the b in the gift shop, oh. that that should not. Yeah. Well, it's you know. We we can save it. We can get back to that in the Q and A. Um, so I think there is a trend also in w in both YA and an adult romance for ro for romances between Jews in concentration camps and Nazis, and um, a lot of them, both from the YA and romance novel camp, are coming um, from inspirational Christian yeah, places. Yeah. 
and um, from a Jewish perspective, super duper problematic. Um, I also think there's uh, a risk with Holocaust literature of the Holocaust serving as a way to edify and um, you know to make a current. It's a, it's a tool to make a modern day teenager appreciate being Jewish and appreciate how good they have it in a way that I find kind of um, cynical and um, trivializing of the Holocaust. That I feel like if you're going to write a Holocaust book, um, it shouldn't just be a setting. It has to be about the Holocaust. And there are, um, I maintain that there are too many Holocaust books for children being published um, by, it's actually interesting, Jewish publishers tend to steer, Jewish children's book publishers, Carbon, Apples and Honey, tend to steer clear of them. Um, and they are really thoughtful about why. Um, because for middle grade and younger, I think you should think really hard about whether you want to tell a Holocaust story and how. Um, but uh, non-Jewish publishers are publishing these gorgeous picture books, beautiful, like high quality production values, um, eight gazillion Anne Frank books. And this is a girl who wanted to be a writer and wanted to tell her own story. And I feel like you should do her the courtesy of reading her words rather than having it be some like sweet inspirational thing that immediately goes to I still believe that, ever that people are good at heart. Yeah, I, I think that the books that you were describing and the books that you were describing <laughs> just now, it's not inherently a problem for non-Jewish authors to write about Jewish stuff. Like it Particularly Jewish suffering. Yes. Like, I mean, well, no, I think that is inherently. Okay. That, to me, that okay. is inherently okay. problematic. But in overall, do you know what I like? It's the highest it's stakes issue. It's like, try a smaller. Yeah. Start yeah, small. Yeah. I definitely <laughs> want the stakes to be small. Go but back to the cracker barrel. Right. <laughs> right. Exactly. Um, I think to me, part of the problem with books like that is that when they are specifically written in this sort of like romance inspirational, which is of course code for Christian, um, there's a fundamental difference in our cultures of atonement and forgiveness. Judaism is, we do it a very particular way. And we all argue about what's good enough and what's not, but at the end of the day, we all have, I think, a in general, a shared understanding of what atonement actually is and the responsibility of the person doing the atoning. Like they have to be very active and the person who might, who the wronged party, they do not have to forgive you. Right. Forgiveness is not required. And the thing is that I think it is in Christianity, it is required. Oh boy, I'm very excited to read it. <laughs> like it is expected, it's required. In, in, the, in a particular Christian worldview. Um, and I just, I think to me, that's the heart of what's wrong. They just don't understand this very fundamental aspect of, of Jewish identity. Which is that we're aggrieved. And we, <laughs> and we I maintain the right to stay aggrieved if I want. <laughs> I feel like you didn't put that in the advance question. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> oh, he likes books about s outer space. He <laughs> oh. <laughs> That would actually be that would actually be a great book. Um, oh God, I have to think about this. You 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 know I I will say this. Um, this is no, this is a weird recommendation. It's ju it's just you know my my stepson uh, is a baseball player and and not Jewish, and I'm always trying to interest him in Jewish stuff by showing him vintage. Uh, newspaper articles and stuff about all the Jewish athletes, Jewish baseball, ju you know, Jewish uh, basketball, and you know, of the 40s and 30s. But that's not a book, so right, I'm. Right. <laughs> it's, just a, it's just a topic. <laughs> it's just a topic. Yeah. 
but I mean, although I have to say, like, those would be the more the kind of biographies I would like to see. There's um, two Mo Berg children's books now. The oh. Spy. Yes. Baseball Spy. Yes, because that I think those stories are actually really fascinating and that those players are forgotten except by people yep. like my dad, you know, who talks yep. about them. Yeah. yeah. I think there are lots of interesting historical sports books, particularly baseball. There's one about Lip Pike, who was really the first Jewish baseball player, um, gorgeously illustrated. Um, uh, I think everybody wants... Jewish sports books that aren't Sandy Koufax, yeah. uh, who yeah. nobody knows now. Um, but I mean, it's a good story. Um, but uh, so I had some thoughts about recent. I don't. I can't do all time favorite. It's okay. just too hard. Okay. But um, recent picture. A recent picture book that I absolutely loved was um, Welcoming Elijah, uh, a Passover Tale with a Tale by Leslie A. Newman. Um, who's best known for Heather is Two Mommies. Um, she is a poet, and I think people underestimate how hard it is to write picture book text. It has to be so short. There are books that I want to love, and I just, they will work in a classroom setting or a library read aloud, but y they're not books for reading at home um, because this is not spinach. You know, parents and grandparents, our job is to make reading an intimate, joyful, lovely conversation, and picture books are a conversation. They're not a thing that you present. Um, she's are you raising your hand? Yeah. Yes, we don't. We're not fans. My mother, my mother wouldn't let me read that book. She found it so horrible. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. Um, <laughs> it's the the notion of the the female char character having to be so self negating, and the kid just taking and taking and taking his whole life, and that it becomes oh I feel bad I'll sit on your stump, um, is not a message I would particularly want to convey to uh, to women to to little girls. Um, but I understand that there is a lot of love for this book. Um, but I was what I was going to say was um, I loved Welcoming Elijah because it's a cat story. It is beautifully written. It, The notion of a stranger at the door at Passover fits in, and if it's a kitten and it parallels Elijah, it's just so well-crafted. And I was actually talking about it at some PJ Library thing, and I printed out the text, and I'm like, oh, my God, this works beautifully without illustrations. And it's short. Um, she knows how to write a children's book. In fact, if you want to write a children's book, looking at what Leslie and Newman has written is a great master class. Um, I also really love the, the People's Painter, which is about Ben Sean. Uh, was that a, oh yeah, that's, that was amazing. Yeah, it's, I, I know people, uh, the, Sydney, the Sydney Taylor Committee after me didn't love it as much as I did, um, they because they felt like the art didn't actually look that much like Ben Sean. But I love this idea of painting as activism. I thought it was it could be read on a, a lot of different levels, um, and I love. Yeah, I think it's beautiful. But I can see how I can see how if you're like you want the style to be really close to Ben Sean, it's not. I, I'm with you. I think it's amazing. Um, middle grade, I think, is the hardest category to write um, because young adult, you can really write like we talk. Picture books, you understand it's an art and it's quick and middle grade is hard um i have two middle grades that i remembered as we were yeah, talking go which, for I, it. which they do sort of break our rule a little bit because they are they are about the holocaust and they are about ashkenazi jews and they are about no, they're leaving no your rules no but it's you know what i loved about them they were i teach them sometimes i teach a writing for children class and they're there too there's when hitler stole pink rabbit yeah, yeah. and then journey to america which is great because it has a girl. I used to play violin, and there's a girl who sews. She she takes her violin, and she glues all the money they have into the lining of the violin case, and then when they're on the train, the Nazis take it anyway. And so, um, but, you know, they're not tragic books. Everybody reaches their appointed conclusion, and they, they have a lot about. And the kids have agency. They have agency, and they have journeys, you know, and, and it, it, 
and it really is, um, you know, and sometimes it's funny. It's like, you know, they'll be in a private school learning French, but, you know, they won't have money for clothes, so their, skort, their skirts are too short. But it'll, you know, it's not these tragic problems necessarily. It's, it's, it's problems, not that I think problems have to be relatable, but it's problems that are useful to a child reader. And so those are two middle grade books that I really love. Um, uh, Journey, Journey to America. Yeah, Journey to America by Sonia Levitan, who, who wrote a lot of books uh, in that, but, but I just love that one. Um, a couple more recent middle grades that I think are amazing is, um, uh, I, I also really like comedy, so I l lean that way, but um, there's one called This Is Just a Test by Madeline Rosenberg and Wendy Wen Lang Sh Shang, uh, which is a kid who is, uh, he's, the, the, the two grandmothers in this book are like laugh out loud funny. It's a kid studying for his bar mitzvah in the 80s. Uh, so there's all this like Betamax humor and like oh. bad, like he's terrified of nuclear war because the morning, the, the day after, the morning after, what was that thing? Oh yeah, the morning the after. Uh, so that was on TV. And he's got a, a Russian Jewish uh, refusenik pen pal who never writes back to him, but he's forced to write to. And the grandmothers are both passive aggressive. One is grandmother is Jewish, and one grandmother is is Chinese and not Jewish, and they're so passive aggressive with each other. It's hilarious. It is laugh out loud funny. Um, and I also really liked. Um, I didn't love it so much, but every kid I know loves it. Is a book called Whistle. Uh, because it's a graphic novel with a brand new DC Jewish superhero uh, who's a young girl. Um, and that's by E. Lockhart. Um, what else did I really like? Yeah, she's amazing. Um, she's so much range. So much range. Um, and because I know people will ask about a good anti Semitism book, Linked by Gordon Corman is a really, he writes page turners. He, they're not art. They are books that kids like to read. Um, Corman. Gordon Corman, K-O-R-M-A-N. Um, and it is somebody's drawn swastikas around the school. Who is it? Um, and that's great. And for YA, I think it will become one of my all-time favorites, even though it's only about three years old, Dancing at the Pity Party. Do you guys know it? No. Um, it's a memoir by a girl whose mom, uh, a young woman whose mom died when she was in college, but it's written, uh, it's very accessible, adorable illustration. And even though it's sad about the mom dying, she gets so much comfort from Shiva, from Jewish traditions. Um, it's, and the illustrations are so good and it's so funny and you wanna hug her. And again, everybody I know has loved it. Um, another one that I really, really love is Dancing at, uh, sorry, is um, Sick Kids in Love by Hannah Moskowitz because it's another one that deals with serious issues but is really funny and Jewishness is not a problem. It's a source of comfort. Um, and one kid knows nothing and one kid is Jewishly identified. You also don't see a lot of romances between two Jewish characters, so it's kind of nice to see that. Um, and again, it's just beautifully written. Um, I wanted to ask about, um, since we've been talking about, you know, wonderful books, crummy books, um, well, first of all, like, for you, what was a turning point where you were able to read a Jewish book thinking, okay, great, like, I'm going to be seeing myself reflected in these pages, I'm going to learn something about my, you know, my ancestry um, and my culture, and instead you're reading it and thinking, oh my god, this is garbage! Like, when did we have enough Jewish books? Like, what's the a turning point where there were enough of them that we could be really specific about how angry we are when they're not good? Well, I, I don't think I reached that point until I had a son. I have a nine-year-old, and uh, I got PJ Library for him. And where he does have some books he loves, you know, some of the books, I grew up going to a workman's circle, and so I learned Yiddish, and I learned a lot of history, and, you know, my parents were big atheists, and so some of the books with Yiddish he really loves. And, you know, we sing the Yiddish songs and pronounce it, he's, like, interested in that. But sometimes when it's, like, you know, these emotional fights over, you know, it's the Hanukkah book. It's the, it's the looming, you know, what Jews are is... Hanukkah 
And, you know, so now he has 40 books about Hanukkah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, his, his school, there's uh, the school we happen to go to does have very few Jews. And so I always wind up being, you know, we, we have a mom comes in for Diwali and for Eid and everything. So I'm always the uh, <laughs> Jew on call. I'm always the Jewish mom, which is great. And I'm, and I'm like the Hanukkah mom. And I always want to be like, you know, this isn't really a real holiday <laughs> for us. <laughs> like our least thing but these are i make really good latkes so here <laughs> <laughs> uh, well my throw it across the room book is a hanukkah book um it's called schmelf the hanukkah elf oh. Oh um and oh I, I hate those wanted hanukkah. To, i want to smash it against a wall so hard um it is an elf who tells santa he realizes that all these kids aren't on the the, the nice list and they're not going to get anything and he's like, well, th and Santa's like, well, their parents bring them stuff. And he's like, but I want to bring, I think we should bring them stuff. And then, th uh, you know, Schmelf, so Santa's like, you go for it. You're awesome. And so Schmelf starts going from house to house and gives presents to the good Jewish children. And kills the and elf. <laughs> <laughs> so I hate it. It's condescending. It is trivializing. It's gross. And it's the rhymes suck. Um, so uh, I, I don't like it at all. Um, but <laughs> I, uh, let's see, what else do I hate? Um, well, there was one about a Jewish, um, again, it got like a, a star from Kirkus, and it's a girl uh, who is a shapeshifter because of um, experiments done on her my, by Mengele. And so she enters this cross-country motorcycle race in an alternate universe in which the Nazis are winning, uh, to, if she wins the race and has a romance with this hot Axis boy, that she can kill Hitler. And I'm just like, I hate this so much, and I hate feeling alone. It got aw it got awards. Um, yeah, it got a star from Kirkus, and people love it, and it's, it was on best lists. And it makes you feel so alone um, as a Jew. Uh, like I just got back last night from a trip abroad, and somebody had put um, Merry Christmas signs all over our building. And I'm like, that's sweet, but uh, like, I was surprised at the visceral pain of it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, oh my God, I'm five. And I don't want, and I, I feel like our, you know, ch children's literature should be a safe place. I mean, that's a horrible cliche, is safe space, but it should be, you know, and it should be, especially in picture book land, it should be a safe place for kids. Although I love this book called uh, Dear Santa, love Rachel Rosenstein, I think, and it's a girl who's just trying her hardest to get Santa to come, and the parents <laughs> are like, not going to happen, and then they go out for Chinese food. That, that's <laughs> like my every day in right. December for me. It's like, can we have a treat? No. <laughs> can we have a treat? No. <laughs> the, um, yeah, I, I, when I saw the mensch on the bench, oh. I was like, okay, it was bad enough that you were doing this elf on a shelf, like introducing your children really, really young to the concept of the surveillance state and acquiescing to it. That is not something that we enjoy or appreciate in this culture. Absolutely not. And like the audacity to think that we were missing out on something. Yeah, yeah, that like, yeah. oh, we were excluding <laughs> these people. Let's give them something that's like their thing, right? No, absolutely not, absolutely not. But I think it's also okay for kids to sit with not being majority yeah. culture at in December. But that's also why we need the really good Passover books and the really good yeah. Rosh Hashanah, like New Year on the Pier. Um, we can pump up our own holidays that are awesome and that are more important than Hanukkah. I, I, I would love a really, really awesome Sukkot book. Like there's, there is one, there's, uh, there's a lovely graphic novel uh, called Moon Cakes by Wendy Shu X U. Yeah, yeah. And that has like, it's got romance, it's got intergenerational stories, it's got a shapeshifter. Um, it's, uh, it's lovely. And, and like these terrific el old ladies <laughs> who are like basically like running everything. And it's set at Sukkot. That's a, that is a real charmer. I, I like that one a lot, but I want more. I want more because I just think that that's my favorite. That's my favorite holiday, yeah. actually. There's some very good picture books about Sukkot that mm -hmm. I don't think anybody would know where that is. Yeah, I would simply love that. Um, oh gosh, I've lost the thing that I was going to talk about. Oh, shoot. I apologize. We're not over. Like we're, we're doing fine. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, please do. And if I get my idea back, I'll just make a note of it. Yeah. Um, 
Okay. Uh, yeah, I feel like I'm just selling, <laughs> but uh, you know, you see all these authors, sp particularly men who have written adult books, getting their, an, a contract to do a, um, you know, a children's book, and they're like, a book like mine has never existed. You know, like this is so important. The market is cr is crying for it, and I'm like, pretty sure it does exist. Um, pretty sure you don't read this genre. Um, so just to give you a sense of the diversity of what is out there, other recent books that I really like are um, Sorry for Your Loss by Joanne Levy, which is a middle grade about a girl growing up in a Jewish funeral home. Mm -hmm. And um, it's funny, it's uh, you know emotionally risky, um, great. Uh, the Genius Under the Table by Eugene Yelchin, who's mostly known as an illustrator, and it's not for every kid, but it's about growing up in the 1960s in Leningrad with a cage, it's a memoir, uh, with a KGB informant living next door and your Jews. Um, and uh, A Place at the Table by Laura Chauvin and Sadia Faruqi, which is um, written by uh, an American Jew and an American Muslim, and they trade it off, and it's these two, it's a Jewish kid and a Muslim kid in a cooking class, one who really wants to be there and the other one whose mom is the teacher and really doesn't want to be there, and it's so foodie, it's so good. Um, what else? Um, oh, in YA, Today, tonight, tonight, Tomorrow by Rachel Lynn Solomon, which is a romance set in Seattle over one night, and it's a friends to enemies story, which is always delightful, and it's two Jewish kids who are, you know, rivals for uh, uh, valedictorian battling it out all the on the last night of school and exploring Seattle, and it's just charming. Um, and I also really like The New Queer Conscience by Adam Le Eli, which is tiny. It's, the, it's this series of books called Pocket Change Collective, and they just make such a good gift because they're just lusciously designed little tiny books, and his is about how um, queerness and Jewishness and activism all work together for him. They're all written by young people. They all have delightful covers, and they're all first person. So if you had a handful of these to give to a kid, that would be a really nice graduation present. I, I'm really glad that you mentioned that book because when I, when I was texting with my 17-year-old, who from birth until age five grew up in an almost exclusively Jewish social and ec um, educational milieu, right? Had absolutely no idea that we were part of any kind of minority. Um, and then when they went to um, their friend's school had a fairly large Jewish population as well. And so even though they began to have an understanding of like, we're not everybody, it wasn't, it took them a very long time to realize like, oh, there's actually a vanishingly small number of us <laughs> you know, like, um, in the world. Um, so I was asking him like, you know, what, are there any books that really um, shaped your Jewish identity, you know, in it knowing now that we're in a small minority? And uh, what they said was, I'm sorry, what was the name of that book? The Jewish Conscience? The New Queer, the New Queer Conscience. Um, be being Jewish and queer, they were like, oh, like we can, oh, these go together. It's not, this is not an oil and water situation. This is a, like, let's blend everything together and it becomes more rich and interesting. So, and of course, like a true child of a librarian, they were like, I got a galley of it at midwinter 2020. I'm like, I said, yes, you did. That's what you did. I love it. Yeah. Did you have? No, it just, all those books were making me think of books that form my identity. You know, for those of you who don't know me, which is all of you a lot, <laughs> a lot of <laughs> <laughs> wrote about with children's books is also reading the adult books on your on your parents' shelves, which I think is a very important children's reading. So I remember, I feel like Marjorie Morningstar oh. really had a big. <laughs> 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 so don't neglect those. You know, don't. I would say don't neglect just leaving the grown-up books around. I think those are terrific. Yeah, I mean, I had a, an experience with my. I think one of my parents was reading Davida's Harp by Chaim Potok, um, who, because this is such a tiny little world and Philadelphia is the largest small town in America, we wound up, uh, his daughter attended our congregation. <laughs> um, and I read that. And Nama, right? uh, no, not Nama, but it, it, this was a very long time oh. ago. Um, so 
Oh, so what my, I think my dad was reading it, and I read it, and I know that a lot of it went over my head. Spanish Civil War? I d I the, my only connection to that was Guernica. Like, I know what that is, you know, but this, this whole other political thing, no, no, no. And then I went on to read My Name is Asher Lev, mm -hmm. which I was obsessed with that book. That is not a YA book, but I, it was a core young adult text for, m for me. And I don't know, this is a, a thing that hasn't come up <laughs> very much lately, but um, when Lynn Melville Miranda was doing like the first sort of big wave of publicity, for Hamilton, um, he mentioned in several interviews that he had optioned, my name is Asher Lev, <laughs> that he had been wanting to write something, yes, to do some type of adaptation for so long, and I was like, oh my God, I need to talk to this man about this. Like, that's a very important thing for him to do. Um, yeah, so I guess we've talked a little bit about criteria, or like we've sort of alluded to things that we know um, are really, really good and worth finding but like let's pretend that we are talking to um like some caring and interested adults who are going to bookstores thinking about gifts for the children in their lives and they are just sort of feeling a little overwhelmed like is there sort of like a cheat sheet that we could give them when you're looking at these books and thinking okay it's got this that the other thing or it's got two out of the three criteria this one's going to be a good one you have people who have done this work for you. Um, so the Sydney Taylor Committee every year, I would look uh, hard at the notables and the honorable, th and the, um, the honor books as opposed to the medal winners um, because there's always gonna be fighting about which book wins. So if you look at the ones that are further down the list, um, uh, there's probably somebody who fought really hard for it. Uh, Look at the whole thing, and you know your kid also. You know who you're buying for. Um, librarians are your friend. You can ask them for recommendations. Um, I, up I did uh, year-end best lists for tablet for, uh, for 15 years, so you can go back. A lot of those books are still in print. Um, and if you know that I'm coming from the place of liking things that are funny and aren't necessarily good for you books, which I feel like gifts shouldn't be good for you books, um, maybe for a bar mitzvah, <laughs> um, but, or ben, uh, a bat mitzvah or a b mitzvah. Um, but mostly, you know, again, I, I said it before, be the safe space and give them things that are fun and let, you know, let school be school. Oh, well, I mean, I guess I can do a what to avoid. But uh, is there a way to avoid it? Absolutely. Well, I think anything, what's always good to avoid, it's, it, it's like if there's already like a big Jewish star or, uh, or a dreidel <laughs> or some barbed wire. Yeah, if you feel like a graphic designer really had to sell it based on the main theme, that's always a good, av avoid that one, you know. Um, it's unfortunate. Jewish like I semaphore. I made a list that was one of, of Sophie's questions about books we're looking forward to. And there's a book that I keep not reading because I hate the cover so much. And everyone tells me how good it is, Aviva and the Dybbuk. And I, s I know I just said no Dybbuk, like people want fewer Dybbuks. But um, you can keep I a just few. look at the cover <laughs> and I don't want to read it. And I feel that way about there's, um, there uh, Deborah Hopkinson has written these amazing books about like the kinder transport. And if you're gonna do a kinder transport book, it's amazing. But you just look at these covers and you just want to, so every time I see a bright, cheerful, vibrant cover, I just want to grab, you know, yay, go you, and grab all the designers who think that a Jewish book has to be, like, very serious. Um, what was I going to ask? Oh, man, I lost my train of thought again. But I, but no, 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 it is absolutely not you. It is, it is this pandemic brain. Um, oh, ooh. All right, we'll go over that in just one moment. Um, I, I will say, as you guys were talking, I thought, oh, like what kind of Holocaust book would I be okay with reading? And actually, the truth is, what I want is uh, a book about someone who survived and then spent the rest of their life seeking out, tracking down, and then maybe vengeance murdering uh, ex-Nazis. <laughs> that is, I will read that all day long. No, no, we did not. Okay. Let's talk about the Deanna Rayborn book. Uh, it's it's an adult book, and it's about um, 
a group of, it's for adults, it's a group of um, female assassins who have spent, and they're now in like their 60s and 70s, and they've spent their lives tracking down Nazis and killing them. And now they're retiring, and they th they think the the organization, the museum is what it's called, that goes and sends them out to kill people. They think that the organization is sending them on a happy retirement cruise, but they're actually trying to kill them. <laughs> and it becomes, it's called, um, oh, Killers of a Certain Age. <laughs> and it's great, fun pandemic reading. The, it's not literature. It's just fun, and I love the idea of these old lady assassins, and I want it to be a movie so bad. Um, but it seemed like, uh, I'll open the book, I'll read it. Yeah, absolutely, thank you. I also have a recommendation that, and it's so weird, but my brother and I love these growing up. Did anyone else read the Oi Oi Seven books? Oi Oi Seven. Oi Oi Seven. It was a, a, a Jewish um, 007. Like, it's oh. a Jewish <laughs> Funny. Yes. They're really, really funny. That's very funny. And they're good. If you have a really goofy, nerdy child, those are sort of fun. You know, if you have a child who makes a lot of puns, that's a kid who, which I was me and my brother, but I had forgotten about those. And those are a great vintage yeah. thing that need to be revisited. I mean, they're probably very sexist. I haven't oh, read um, them in a right. long time. <laughs> that, yes, book. he likes Facebook. Um, That's incredible. Great. Um, I, I saw your note that we have 10 minutes left, so we're going to take some questions. If you have them. Yes, all the way in the back, all the way in the back, and then we'll come to you. We just started on those two, and those are better, yes. I agree with you. Um, I was thinking in, in addition to all the other sort of 11-year-old middle graders I talked about, All Three Stooges by Erica Pearl, which PJ Library won't touch with a 10-foot pole because it, it deals with um, a parent's suicide. Not the kids, the kid's friend. But the kid who is the main kid is a student of American comedy, which means a student of Jewish comedy. And it is so funny and so thoughtfully done, and anything Erica Pearl writes, she's written a lot of middle grade, and she's very thoughtful about gender roles, and she does a ton of research that do the seams don't show at all, and they're, they're funny books, but they are delightful and great. Um, she wrote um, uh, something about getting OJ. Um, my friend with, the, with who's, who's tech, you know, can you look up Erica Pearl for me? <laughs> yeah, you. <laughs> No, no, I didn't mean that. I didn't mean that. That I was, I was saying thank you because you looked things up as I was. Yes, I no, that was wasn't. I wasn't calling you out at all. <laughs> I was saying thank you. Delightful, a picture book. It's Hanukkah, but it's about being a helper. It's about the shamash, and it's about wishing there were a ninth night of Hanukkah to thank the people who have helped you. Who? Oh, I don't know that one. That sounds. Not my thing, but okay. <laughs> um, but her middle grades, is something about OJ. Something about, uh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> when Life Gives You OJ, and there's a sequel to that, and that's about uh, a relationship between a kid and their Zadie, and it's adorable um, and funny. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am, in the middle. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 
Yes. They, yeah, they a, are a TV now. Series, I think. A TV yeah. series. Yeah. Yeah. With for Disney Plus, I think. Yeah, yeah, I'm no, no. I have to tell you, they might get it wrong. <laughs> That's generally I what really happens. <laughs> I really have a lot. I, I, I hold out some hope there. I think they do make some some good decisions. We'll see. Um, I have a prop from the movie of the Chosen. Uh, they, you know, they filmed the movie um, in Park Slope because they couldn't get permission to film in Hasidic Williamsburg, and my brother somehow got a hold of this absolutely giant fake wooden tailor sign that looks like it's from you know the 1900s but it was from 1980 when they made the movie and it has total you know this uh you know mendel you know the tailor sign all in yiddish is pride of place in my house we have time for i think two more questions i think yes up front That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying read Anne Frank. Don't send, don't give me picture books about Anne Frank. No, they they have most of their. Uh, that's what I wrote about in the Times. Is a disproportionate number of them are Holocaust books. So they are out there, and I can uh, I can tell you about other books about anti-Semitism and the Holocaust that I think we need them, but I think there are too many bad ones. And people take it, and people say, I'm going to write an important book about an issue. And you've made the challenge of writing a book that much harder for yourself because any book is hard to write. And writing a good Holocaust book is difficult. And that's why you should and talk to librarians and look at the ones that Sidney Taylor, if you know that there are, if you know that a third of the books that come out are going to be Holocaust books, then look to see which ones have gotten uh, acclaim from Jewish librarians. I agree th with that. I also, uh, it sort of brings up the question of what is the function of Jewish children's literature? I think its function for Jewish children is very different from its function for Gentile Absolutely. children and Gentile adults. Like it's, yeah. So to, to me, the, the function of Jewish literature for children is to help a Jewish child figure out who who are you, right? Like, what what are you going to bring to the world? It's a totally different thing for kids who aren't Jewish. And they do need to read a lot of Holocaust books, in my experience, because they often, you know, teenagers I know who are not Jewish, they do not know anything. And I, I was so thrilled when a class that I know of got assigned night. I was like, great, these kids should read it, you know. Right, right, right. So White Bird is a graphic novel that recently won Sid, uh, Sidney Taylor, I think it won the medal. Um, terrific, really thoughtful, not a Jewish author. Um, but we didn't live through the Holocaust either. And I think if someone does the work, they can write a Holocaust book. You don't have to be Jewish to write a Holocaust book. Um, but you have to be really thoughtful and talk to a lot of Jews and talk to a lot of experts. And this is another one that she did the work. Um, there's another one called The Assignment by Liza Weimer that people really like, uh, which is um, about um, how do you teach this? And uh, how do you, what happens when you teach it badly? Um, it's very thoughtful. Um, they are out there, and um, I encourage you to dig in. Um, I, th I think the Holocaust, the Holocaust Museum has a list on its site about what a, a book should do, a Holocaust book should and shouldn't be, and um, uh, don't romanticize history by overemphasizing heroic tales or the worst aspects of n human nature, but don't make it sound as if there are too many heroic, uh, were as many heroic Gentile rescuers as there were villains either. Contextualize history, make responsible methodological choices, be really careful about graphic material. I mean, you, we grew up on those film strips, yeah, and photographs, and that is not, that is not a way, 
that is not ped pedagogically sound. Do try to select images and texts that do not exploit the student's emotional vulnerability. Um, so I think they're going to be publishing a new, th the titles on their website are just so old, um, and I think they're going to be publishing a newer list pretty soon. I think we are at time. Um, if you're inclined to stay for one more question, we could probably do one more. Yes, in the back. Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. Journey to Save Curious George about that. It's so good. It's really great. There's a children's there's a children's one and there's an adult one. Sorry, what was the title again? The Journey to Save Curious Curious George. George. It's the very well done. Great. Good to know. All right, well thank you everybody who came. We really appreciate that. And thank you to Lizzie and thank you. Marjorie. Thank you. My pleasure.